And we're live and I'm back, folks. Yes, it's been a while. I've got an awesome guest today for my for the revenge of John Reed and hits and misses video show. I've got uh, Paul Richards, director of marketing with Huddle Cam HD, who's taught me a ton about putting on better virtual and hybrid events. I'm so excited to have you here today, Paul. Hi, John, and hi everybody online. Thanks for joining. Yep, as usual, uh, you get to disrupt this show with your questions and comments. This is not faux interactivity. This is the real thing, so you can chime in at any time, uh, but just be prepared. We're going to read your comments if I like them. Um, anyhow, uh, yeah, I've been off the air for quite some time. Uh, have had some health issues, not COVID. Uh, Thomas, welcome to the chat. Uh, I've had some health issues, not COVID, um, but I'm not going to get into that now because I want to want to say that I'm on the mend, I'm doing well, and uh, and I and I really want to have this conversation with with Paul. Now, uh, Paul and I are actually using his company's equipment, so we're going to get into that later as well. Um, but and Paul's going to give you a real cool tour of his studio because man, he he puts puts me to shame. But one of the things I really want you to understand is that that Paul had to learn about this just like we all did. And he got better and better at it. It's not like one, one night he woke up and he's a genius. At least I think that's the case, right? Paul, you, you worked at this over time. We did. And I have some pictures of my very first studio about six, seven years ago. I can share with you. It takes some time, but it's really beneficial. And I think uh, we're going to talk about it today. Great. So uh, those of you who follow Digitonomica know that I've written an excoriating series of articles hammering event planners for what I perceive as sort of massive creative failures in both virtual events and hybrid events. Um, and sometimes I feel like I can be a little too harsh and not offer up enough tips and suggestions. Today, we're going to change that because uh, one of the really cool things about Paul is that Paul was working on hybrid events before pandemic time. So you were already thinking about this as far as uh, how you could create a really interesting hybrid business model that's both more inclusive, so people who can't make it on the ground can be there, but also that it's a really interesting monetization opportunity and a great broadcast challenge. So you wrote a book. Uh, in fact, you've written more than one book on on virtual streaming. The one I have is The Virtual Ticket, How to Host Private Live Streams and Virtual Events. Uh, and one of the great things that, that, you, that I saw in a summary of that, uh, you said... Um, uh, through you've you built a stream geeks geeks community. I'm going to ask you to tell us about. You said you have an impressive following, tight knit online online community, and you continue to inspire, motivate, and inform those who refuse to settle for mediocrity. So I love that we we're not setting for medi mediocrity anymore, Paul, on our hybrid or virtual events, right? That's right. You know, I mean, we saw this coming long before the pandemic. I mean, the need for live video communications and streaming to make your event much more scalable and reach audiences all around the world is important today. It'll be important tomorrow. But today, it's imperative that we learn how to rise above kind of the mediocrity and, uh, you know, shine and, and make your events come alive. You know, we all know this is not something that's going to go away tomorrow at this point. Uh, so we got to learn how to use the technology to grow, and it's truly possible um, to really shine and, and do amazing things with this technology. Right. So I guess we can divide our time a little bit. We'll talk about both hybrid and virtual events because I think event organizers are kind of scrambling between these two formats as as <laughs> our unpredictable uh, life uh, plows on here. Uh, but I, Paul, also has some tips for us. We're going to be counting down on on sort of the the best tips for hybrid events and also some gotchas to avoid uh but but in the hybrid scenario this was interesting to me because this pre-covid times now you went to some events where you just were kind of surprised right that that like they actually had cameras set up and yet they weren't taking advantage of live streaming so can you kind of tell us how that sort of sparked your interest in the stream geeks organization around uh hybrid and live streaming yeah. So, you know, I've been to many, many trade shows. We go to the NAB show, which we were going to help live stream before it was canceled two weeks ago. Um, we go to Las Vegas. We go to all these conferences and I've seen, I've seen it all. You know, most very large conferences until very recently had no digital component, no online streaming. Uh, the National Association of Broadcasters, who is, you'd think would be broadcasting, was only streaming to a private network that was only on their website because they wanted so much control. And to me, being you know a millennial, a younger person, wondering, why isn't this on Facebook? Why isn't this on YouTube? Why 
this is free content. Why are you not using social media to, to bring people in, and engage? And it just, these questions weren't being asked at the highest mm -hmm. levels of large trade show organizations. So, you know, today everyone's got a hybrid scenario and, you know, I'm happy to talk about what I've seen work, but even before this whole pandemic, it was like, there's a huge business model beyond people who are willing to fly to Las Vegas or come to your event, which is located in XYZ state, let's make it scalable. It's economical. We can reduce ticket prices for virtual to fit the ROI that you can deliver. And the virtual ticket is about how can we make that ROI better? And how can mm. we br have a digital approach that brings ROI? Because there is so many different ways to do it. And um, it makes your event scalable. It makes your event more accessible. John, you you attended the present summit, which was mm. kind of a case study for me, where we had someone who could literally was in a wheelchair, could never go to our conference in person, and was able to attend virtually and get a pretty good experience out of it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I one of my favorite moments in that whole whole event, the present summit, was hearing him talk to that experience and how, you know, he had felt sort of perpetually excluded from events and and that that had changed. For him as a result of that and that was when a lot of light bulbs went off for me thinking like wait this shouldn't be something we're just doing as a coping exercise in the pandemic this should be something we're thinking about long term from a business model and inclusion perspective and, and also because if you do it right it's just plain fun to do right i mean it is it really is and you know edutainment is my favorite word in that category the ability to educate and entertain has been studied we need to have fun when we learn. It increases our learning capabilities and it makes everyone's attention and focus that much better, which allows you to do your job even better. So, you know, if we can make it fun for us and sometimes that's hard, John, because the technology is scary, right? We're not sure if we can pull all of this off. We're not sure if there's going to be an audio issue or a video issue. And that's where Stream Geeks came from. It's like, well, let's create, you can go to streamgeeks.us. It's just totally free content about solving issues, overcoming problems, and seeing what the latest and greatest is out there because every year the technology gets better. Every year there is something that's an anarchy or an archaic system that's being replaced that people are still using. And so it's incredible when I talk to people and say, did you know if you do it this way, it's half the cost and it's twice as good? It happens all the time with technology these days. So learning about the latest and greatest can save you money, make you better prepared, can be more reliable. What's happening with the cloud and smartphones and live streaming technology is just incredible. Absolutely. So, uh, Thomas, you said that you want to, you're looking forward to, uh, learning uh what is uh what is missing from your home studio and i'm going to try to accommodate that with with paul giving you a bit of a, a tour here in just a few minutes but before we do that i, I want to talk a little bit about the present summit event because i actually wrote about this uh in diginomica if you do a search for present summit on diginomica you'll find a couple different articles i wrote the reference to that um but it was a really kind of a lightning ball moment for me about exceptional interactivity at events and and, and I thought it really addressed a lot of concerns that I've heard from large-scale enterprise software event organizers, which is like, well, I couldn't put on an interactive event for, you know, 10,000 people or whatever. But what was so interesting about what you did there is you essentially had two tracks. You had, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but you had a free track that was very accessible that had ongoing YouTube live streams and all that. But you had a premium track, which I was given access to as a media member, uh, which was a paid track. Uh, and, and that track focused on interactive sessions. And the reason the structure makes so much sense to me is, look, not everyone's going to want, let's face it, not everyone's going to want to pay for an online event, no matter how great it is. Well, that's fine. They have the YouTube videos. They could register and watch that. And that's fine. Um, you know, or, or they could just get the stream if you decide not to even require registration for that. That's your choice. But then this, this premium track really had high value for the participants. I mean, the and, and the cool thing was just what was happening in, in that in that room was kind of a Zoom room kind of vibe. You guys were in studio facilitating hosting. Um, as keynote speakers rolled off the stage, they would join the informal discussions that were happening. And the coolest thing was you guys weren't lecturing anyone about, oh, you should be watching the keynote videos. <laughs> like you were okay with that because you knew like, look, if I really want to watch a keynote video, I can catch the 
the replay later. Uh, but and, and that's what we saw backstage, and, and it was so cool too because the keynote speakers would come off and they were like really different types of people from really different backgrounds. And suddenly they're having this discussion with with attendees, and it was just such a fantastic environment. And you had um folks like the author of the landmark book, The Experience Economy. I'm spacing on his name, Joe uh Joseph uh, Pine. Yeah, Joe Pine was back there. And I mean, that guy is like hugely influential in the whole sort of sort of vision of the of the experience economy that I think informs these ideas. So to me, that was just such an amazing event. And and I was so inspired by it. And then in the subsequent months, I got a little bit disappointed to to see so few people so few pe- people even try it. But that was really cool, right? As far as just sort of proving that that kind of model can work. Well, yeah, and we've kind of pioneered that model via Stream Geeks on a normal live stream, monthly live stream, where it's like we've got the live stream and we know there's a lot of people who like a passive experience. They don't want to turn their camera on. They don't want to turn their microphone on. They just want to watch passively. Maybe they're doing work and they have it on in the background. You know, who knows when you've got 100 viewers, how many of them are intently focusing. But to give the attendees the option to upgrade their experience and collaborate and share and ask those questions directly to the speakers who after they leave the live stream track go into the zoom session it was it was a really great experience for everybody and we actually worked directly with joseph pine to not only design that model but then to design something he called a world cafe collaboration session where you take a large group of people in a Zoom meeting, and maybe it was 100 people, and you break them down into smaller breakout groups so that more people have more voice and people can collaborate and get to know people a little bit more intimately. And I felt like that side of it also turned Mm. out really well. And these are off-the-shelf tools. We're talking about free YouTube live streaming. We're talking about a regular Zoom room license. It wasn't even a Zoom room. It was just a Zoom meeting license. And, you know, those are the tools we used to put together something that was really, um, you know, impactful. Absolutely. Uh, in just a second, I want to, I want you to give a tour, but I just wanted to ask you about some of the sort of various terminology that you sent me and how you think about this. One, one of the things you talked about was thinking digital first. What did you mean by that? Yeah. So, you know, hybrid essentially means that you've got people in a room and then you've got online audiences. And I think if you have that, you should all have somebody in your organization thinking digital first because too many times the live stream is just a camera in the back and there's no interactivity and nobody is thinking digital first. Right. What I'm seeing now is people going, you know what? The audience online is so much bigger than the people who are attending. We need to start thinking digital first. And depending on your, you know, where you're at, you might be somewhere in the middle. But you need to set that line. That's the bar. Digital first thinking. It's like that's where you're interacting. That's where you are, you know, considering the audience, helping them upgrade their live stream experience to a virtual meeting experience, even if it's just for concierge service. Like, what is the best digital first experience that we can possibly deliver as an organization? And Mm. can you get there and still have your event? Yes. But don't forget that digital first is kind of the modern future of, you know, for online attendees. If you've got somebody thinking digital first, the online attendees will know they will stay and they will ultimately get more value out of your event. Excellent. And I want to get into more a little bit later about sort of making the most of hybrid event structures and things like that. But let's, let's talk about, about your studio. So, so, so first of all, you and I are both using huddle cam HD cams for, for today's event. Uh, now I'm, I'm now officially thanks to you, part of a huddle cam HD, a so-called influencer program. Now let's be fair. Um, I'm not sophisticated with this type of thing. Um, so I'm not and, and my, my home office studio that I'm filming in now doesn't give me a whole lot of flex though. I'm working on an office studio that I think is going to be a little more uh, flexible in terms of what I can do. Cause the huddle cam's got a lot of various zoom and panning and tilting options. I can't use as well in this space. Um, but the thing that I, I guess I wanted to say was like, it's pretty neat that, that I got something like that. That was so much more powerful than this, this like zoom camera that I had before that was like, it wasn't, it was kind of like the stream was choppy and it was just like, and, and people have heard me say on these shows that I don't give a crap about production values, but that's not true. I, I mostly the reason I've hammered away at that a little bit is I've been to a bunch of enterprise events with, with people with deep pockets who I, who I felt felt were spending 
more money on production and they should have been spending more money on the content. Um, but, but that's a different problem. Um, I do think it's important to think about production and especially audio, um, but I count video as well. So Paul, why don't you show us around a little bit and show us how your studio is set up? Yeah, I am excited to do that. One thing I want to do before I completely show you, and if you want to take me full screen here, um, oh yeah, let me see if I can. I, I would like to show you guys where I started before I show you guys where we're at now. Um, six or seven years ago, this is me in front of a green screen, and I had a camera zoomed into me. I went into a green screen, and that was that was how we 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 did it. Um, mm -hmm. You can see kind of like what what that what that look like i mean it was nothing fancy it was like a conference room in our in our office and we went through like a really creative process that we were like you know what this is working like we're getting views on youtube we're live streaming we were making a lot a lot of videos and a lot of live streams and every once in a while one would go somewhat viral right one would get really popular and we were like man this is making a significant impact on our business so we actually hired some professionals to put together this is our first studio that we ever did um, and you can kind of see that there. We had like a brick background, a blue background. We mm. had a professional set and we got a YouTube subscribe pillow, things like that. Um, and you can see from this picture, it's just a nook of a side of a conference room. Right. And if you can see that, but it's just like, you know, yep. it wasn't, we were just inventing it. It's just a wall that we invented, but it, it looks pretty good on video. So it really helped to kind of, again, get away from like being mediocre and trying to uh, really build something. This was our second studio here. That's what we got. Now at this point we have a producer working full time, uh, working the live streaming software back there. Um, this was, a, we upgraded our studio, started to do some new things. And now where I'm at right now is our third studio. Um, and what we did, you can sort of see in this picture is we put in a stand up desk and that's going to be one of my tips today is like stand up. You know, get the blood flowing, mm. uh, get creative. And what I'll do now is I'll switch to uh, this camera and I'm going to zoom out and sort of show you our studio here. Oh, cool. So now this is our, this is the third studio um, that I've ever done. But one thing you'll notice right away is I'm, I got a wireless microphone, right? Now you can see my Crocs. Uh oh, I didn't want you guys to see that. It's okay. Um, just joking. But uh, I'm totally mobile. Right, I can walk around. I can do stuff. We've got three different sets. We're using every single wall differently. This is our our Stream Geek set. We've got PTZ cameras kind of everywhere. More than probably most people need, but you know we're showing this tech off all the time. Uh, lights, all kinds of stuff here. But the one thing that is like my favorite thing that if I had to buy like one thing again, it was just a stand up desk. It's just it's mm. just a stand up desk, and I, it, usually a lot of times it'd be like me over here, and then I have a co host. Now that's another thing, John is a co host. Now mm. I know you bring on guests remotely, and that's a good way to do it too. But man, a lot of times I I was trying to be the educator, and it's just me, and I'm just talking, yeah. talking, talking. Uh, getting a co host or or someone to interview really helps. Uh, but yeah, that's a little look at the studio here. We've come a long way. We've got a beast of a live streaming computer to make it all work and uh that's where the producer sits and then this is our main streaming area here you can see we even have like a camera on the ceiling to shoot down um it's pretty it's pretty in-depth it's more than most people need but it is something that you might see you know at like a modern corporation or you know something like that sure absolutely and and when you bring in guests do you have them on like video monitors as well or how does that we work? do. Um, let me see if I have another camera that can show you a couple different angles here. Let me see. Okay. Um, is it this one. Okay. This one here is uh, going to be able to show you the other side of the room here. Oh, sorry. I'm going a, little, going a little out there. So this side of the room, I'm going to zoom out and go a little slower. Sorry. That's, that's how I'm monitoring you right now. Oh, cool. So, over there, I that's the that's the broadcast studio, and that's called a confidence monitor. So from there, I can see whoever I'm talking to, and that's why my main camera is kind of right over there. So it looks like I'm looking at you when I'm doing uh, when I'm over here. Yeah, uh, we have an interesting comment from Irit. 
Uh, I lo- she loves the speaker moving and being able to use some props and whiteboards. Too bad most of us don't have that option in our home offices. Uh, do you have any tips for people who are like maybe not in in a in an office setting or where they have a lot of room? But is there one or two things they might want to try? Well, you know, you mentioned that you're using the Huddlecam HD Pro, and that's like mm. a mini PTZ camera. So what that allows you to do, you can zoom in and out. It's like a webcam with a remote, so you can zoom out. You, know, you can get that tight shot right. like John has, and then you can zoom out and, and yep. show a whiteboard. Or you can do something like a PTZ preset where you're able to have a preset on a whiteboard. Um, you know, there's a lot of tricks. Like you just saw four or five different cameras, right? How did I do that? Well, mm-hmm. we have, we're using uh, OBS, which is a free software that allows you to kind of connect. So I'm connecting to um, Streamlabs. So Maybe if your home office is a little messy, maybe you just have like one little whiteboard area with a second camera, and then you can switch the the two cameras that you have with OBS, but still maintain one connection to Zoom or StreamYard or whatever you're using for your video. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And one thing I'll say too, like for me, one things that helped me with, because you guys sent me this demo version uh, of the Huddle Cam HD to and, and once I got it figured out, I was playing with the presets because what I realized was, yeah, that's a zoom in and out that I can do. But that what the big thing for me was the lighting presets, because like if the sun goes down or changes here, my lighting totally changes because I have these huge windows on the right hand side. So I've got all these presets now so I can be like, OK, it's getting darker. And in the middle of a broadcast, that's pretty awesome because of uh, you know before that and 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 i think anyone in a home office setting where they have sunlight like those presets can be super handy yeah the huddle cam hd pro is great and then there's an ip version of the huddle cam hd pro which is ethernet connected and powered over ethernet so in my home office which is like a 20 it's kind of big because it's on my third floor i've actually got like three or four network connected cameras because you run out of usb ports at a certain point so yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You want to have like a close because I like make things sometimes. So I have like a close up camera, a webcam, and then maybe like one more different angle camera and go using your network. Now, I know a lot of people just have a router from their internet service provider, but if you get a network switch, you can power like two or three more cameras pretty easily and bring them in over the network as opposed to trying to run all these USB cables and running out of connections. Talk to us a little bit about lighting. How do you think about lighting for for event? Not so much for Zoom, like casual office meetings, but for like events that you might put on or charge for. How do you think about lighting? Well, you know, th- you really should have three lights at least or four per person. As crazy mm-hmm. as that sounds, um, and that's like perfect scenario. Um, right here, right now is not a bad um, way to show it off. You see, I've got one here. So that's like, uh, what it, that would be a fill light from behind. Um, yep. then on the other side, you can barely see it, but there's, that's like the key right there. And yep. then in the corner over here, I've got my backlight. So it's, it's a lot of lights. It's more, it's more than people realize three is the minimum. And then four is ideal. I've got four on right now. Um, and you can just see like, like look like behind my hair. It's like, a, there's a hair light. So I pop off the background because there's light behind me that helps me kind of pop off. Um, you don't need to light the background as much as you need to light the subject. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting on lighting. Do you have a, uh, if you go to Stream Geeks, do you have some lighting stuff on there? We do. Uh, I can't remember. We've been making articles for six years, so I can't remember back. There's got to be But if they, do a cer- if they do a search on lighting on Stream Geeks, they could probably find something. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I will say too, when I got a higher def webcam, it did, it did put the pressure on me to work on my lighting some. And I've got a bunch of lighting from my former video production days, but a lot of them didn't work in this space for a variety of reasons. But um, ring lights are super affordable. And the ring light that your team recommended, like definitely upgraded my lighting significantly. And I I do have a side light going on and I could have set up a third. Um, But yeah, I totally agree with you because every light that I turn on, if it's well-placed, like definitely improves uh, the setup and, and my lights are very inexpensive. I, I find it's more about placement than the expensive nature of the lights. Yeah, I agree. And LEDs don't really take much electricity. They're, they're cool to the touch. So the technology has come a long ways there. 
Right. And, and the final piece then is, uh, and Thomas, by the way, I hope you're getting some uh, home studio tips. Uh, just revisit your comment there. I, I hope you're, you're taking a few notes here and feel free to, to add further questions on that. How do you think about audio? So, you know, audio is super important. It's more important than video. And when we're talking about hybrid events, in-person events, it's, it's, it's complicated. It really is. In fact, if I grab, I, I actually have some diagrams if you wanted to see what, so basically, I don't know if we mentioned this on the stream, we were talking about it earlier. I was just about to put on uh, the official NAB show live stream in, in NAB, at NAB in Las Vegas next week. So I would have been in, if it wasn't canceled, I would have been in Las, Las Vegas right now. And my plan for Las Vegas was going to have four people with headsets and, and microphones. Okay. And the reason why is because it, it's a, it's a noisy, I was assuming it would be a noisy convention hall. So everyone can hear each other because they've got the headsets. Um, and then there's a back channel from the producer. So if the producer says, Hey, you know, you wrap up. There's only five minutes left. It, the back channel from a digital audio mixer, which I have here, but we don't need to go that technical. Uh, you know, it helps communication. Um, this is my, if you're like on, like on set, like you see it in like news broadcasters at the baseball games and whatnot, you go with something like this. I'm in a studio right now. And again, I'm mobile, right? So this is a wireless headset so I can walk around. It's always right there. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if I look this way. It doesn't matter if I look that way because I'm mobile. I need to move. I like to keep the blood flowing. Um, what you've got going on is great, but it does really kind of anchor you to that right. location. If you walk away to the whiteboard, I'm probably not going to be able to hear you very well. No, not at all. I exactly. Yeah, no, no, it's true. I'm, I'm definitely like er ergonomically bound, whereas you, you're able to really move around. So, uh, but, but definitely like that proximity between you know, your mouth and whatever's picking up your sound is, is crucially important, especially in a hybrid scenario where there's background noise. There's no question about that. It's, and I'll, I'll give you a secret, uh, that I do. Um, so, and I was literally on the phone with, with people from zoom cause I, I work with zoom a lot and they're like, how do you get your audio to sound so good? Like, please tell us. And it basically, I'll be honest, this is a $500 microphone. So yeah, maybe that's out of reach to a lot, for a lot of people. But this is a really expensive DPA microphone from Europe. And then I take that audio and I use professional audio plugins from Waves. And uh, it's just audio processing. So what it'll do, it's like a radio broadcaster. Like they're going to compress it. So my voice doesn't peak ever. And even if I start yelling, it's going to compress. And it does noise suppression because you'd be surprised how much a good microphone will pick up a light that mm -hmm. has a hum or, you know, a voice or a whisper or something and just, just noise in the room. There's amazing algorithms to just reduce background noise and only, you know, focus and capture your voice. So yeah, get the microphone as close to your mouth as possible. And if you're looking to like super impress people and really go above and beyond, we have videos about the audio plugins that we use. And I'm told that it sounds very clear. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and, and in my mind, that's, that's one of the things where it, the art of the possible for hybrid events starts with audio, because especially in the enterprise world where we live in, I know you're an advocate for entertainment and I, I, I understand why, but audio content is the bottom line because sometimes you're, you're going to be watching a speaker for 15 or 20, 30 minutes. And, and if, if the audio is, is not up to par, you're just, the diminishing returns hit very quickly. So got to have it. Cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot for that tour. We can potentially revisit that if there's any other, other questions. Oh, Thomas, you're asking about a uh, good directional mics. He's got a sure MB seven. I mean, I don't want to know if I want to get too deep into, uh, into sound equipment, but probably your audio guides would point people in some directions. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of the Audio Technica shotgun mics. If if you're looking for su to be super directional, uh, if you're hitting the showroom floor or you need to get right up on somebody, in fact, I've got one right here. I can show you guys uh, that I recommend quite a bit, um, which is the classic, right? The classic Shure M58. Uh, Thing about oh, yeah. these babies is you just got to know how to use it. You got to be right up on this baby if you want it to work. Um, right. if you're looking for something that you're going to point at somebody, you know, to get it right at it, that's where you're looking at a, 
um, shotgun mic. And those are great if you know how to use them because they just go, sh it's like a flashlight. It's like, that's where I want to pick up my audio. And that's pretty amazing if, if you want to go that direction. In fact, some people, John, will have a, a similar scenario as you where they know exactly where they're going to be, but they don't want a microphone on the table and they don't want it right in their face. And they right. put up one of those directional microphones on the ceiling yeah. or out of the camera frame and point it right at where they're sitting. Yeah, absolutely. There's also some good options with lavalier mics that can work pretty well in some cases also. So, uh, but, but in general, again, it goes back to thinking through the audio ahead of time and making sure that your pickup is close to your mouth and, and addresses background noise in a, in a meaningful way. So let's talk a little bit about hybrid because one of the things that's been going on lately, and, and I'll, I'll give you my quick theory. I think that event organizers had a fantasy that we were going to be back together in person this fall. And I think that was why they kind of fell back on innovation on events. And now there's no more excuses. Events have to push the envelope here because more events are going to be virtual. And the ones that are on the ground, you need, you need a hybrid backup plan, if not a monetization scheme. <laughs> I mean, you know, either way, whether it's a backup in case you have to cancel or, or, or better yet, it's a forward thinking way of making your event more inclusive and superior. But here's the thing. And I've been writing about this on Diginomica. You can search for hybrid events and see my view on this. Hybrid events are not about streaming your keynotes. That's just the beginning. <laughs> That's not a hybrid event. Uh, I don't know how many times I can say it. So, 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 Paul, you have some great hybrid tips we're going to go through. But what are your thoughts on sort of taking steps away from thinking that, oh, yeah, we streamed our keynotes, so now we have a hybrid? What, what, what else would you want to see? I know you talked about that under digital first. What would you want to see for a hybrid event? Well, and I, I'm really open about, you know, what we were planning at the 2021 NAB show. I was like, this is our chance. Major, it's the world's largest broadcast show. Let's show the world what a, what a return to person is going to be like. Sadly, it was canceled because there wasn't the attendance that people didn't believe in it. The, the Delta variant was going too high and it kind of broke my heart. But here's what we were planning. We wanted to do mobile live streaming to show people the showroom floor. And if you've got a keynote, yeah, you're going to stream the keynote. But are you going to stream a behind the scenes, you know, interview with the CEO that's exclusive for that audience and give them, uh, you know, I mean, you're, you see it's out there. You see what Twitch is doing. It's incredible. Twitch is a live streaming platform. Twitch has purchased a really big venue in New York City, the Bowery, and kept it going, kept it from going under. And they live stream the events. There's no audience. But then as soon as the music's over, the, the, the DJ or the musician sits down and answers questions from, from Twitch, from the live stream audience, for 30 minutes. And it's like there's a huge crowd there. And you feel like you're part of it. So it's about finding those opportunities that make sense for you to deliver that interactivity. So at the NAB show, we were like, all right, as soon as the, as soon as the live stream starts, I want to be on the showroom floor. I, was, I don't know if my live view backpack is anywhere around here, but we were going to have like a mobile streaming backpack, hit the showroom floor, and just literally bring the chat with us. What do you guys want to see? What are your questions? Let's go into the event. A lot of people are kind of thinking, I think, you know, let's just set up a live streaming system and just stream from one location. But with the cloud, you can, with and a few smartphones, you can have someone streaming from over there and someone streaming from over here, and you can have your main streaming system and you can cut between them to produce something really amazing. So, um, you know, the cloud is really changing things. And I get it that it's new. And we've got some videos on. I published a video on our Stream Geeks channel about what we were planning to do. But I would say, yeah, go, go beyond the keynotes. And sometimes it is a virtual thing that you're offering. As we mentioned, we live streamed our keynotes at the Presence Summit. But we allowed people to jump into a Zoom right. session where the keynote speaker eventually ended up. And then a lot of the thinking was planning the Zoom meeting. How are we going to bring people into small groups? How are we going to get the speakers in and out? Are there going to be exercises that everyone are, is participating in? Tons of value that you can deliver virtually. But from a live streaming perspective, there's tons of tricks too that you can do to make it super engaging. I mean, if you look at IRL streamers, in real life streamers, they take people to New York City, they take people to Ireland, they take people to Rome, and they just walk them into cathedrals and they walk them right into beautiful places. You can't stop watching because mm -hmm. it's so engaging. How can we bring that into uh, an event that's mm -hmm. already planned and make it 
make it so that the viewers are seeing behind the scenes. Make it so the viewers feel like they have some type of control. You know, we can't deliver them an in-person experience, but can we deliver them a voyeuristic kind of avatar experience where they're part of it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think one thing too is like you could conceive of it in terms of, okay, like, like with your presence uh, event, like, yeah, you might have a smaller group that really wants that interactive experience, but how could you create a, a, a hybrid online track for those people? And, and it wouldn't have to be a, a huge audience necessarily, but it would be a VIP audience of people that you know are important that you could invite or you could charge if you want to go the monetization route or what have you. Uh, but, but the point being like, and then give those folks a more special experience like you described uh, where, where, where you do bring people off the keynote stage for interviews and interaction or, and, and one thing I always suggest to people is like, yeah, you probably can't live stream every session at your event. That's okay. But what if you designated one room or one stage as your live stream stage? Right. And, and so you start incrementally that way. And, and within the context of that stage, you have someone like yourself that might be doing some facilitating and hosting and making it a more, sort of community experience than just showing like a, a stream of a stage, which is going to get impersonal very fast. Right. So I think there's some really creative uh, opportunities here. Yeah. And I think from an event planner perspective, think VIP, what can you deliver beyond a simple stream and the content that you're already planning? What are the extra values? Can you ask the speakers to join a zoom meeting for 15, 20 minutes afterwards, right? Can you already paying them? Can you put that into mm -hmm. the contract? Think ahead. How can you like enhance the virtual experience beyond a simple live stream? And I think Zoom and other platforms make it really easy. Um, you, know, you can roll a Zoom room in a mobile cart into the space, right? And it just got the Zoom meeting. So now the speakers can see all the faces of the people who are actually talking, right? And mm -hmm. now maybe you need to have a Zoom moderator on your team to unmute people and kick out zoom right. bombers and there is another set of things you need to think about and, and i talk about it in the virtual ticket book um so it's not easy i'm not going to say it's easy but using right. zoom simplifies it right using off-the-shelf live streaming software makes it easier and then right. you hopefully you can get as a event planner get into that creative mode get into that that mode of thinking that you're good at right that's what you're good at you're an event planner just got to shift the way we look at things yeah, I think the other message I just always want to get across to people, because sometimes I hear them saying, well, you know, the software's not quite there yet, or the equipment is too expensive, or or the skills are too sophisticated. And what I, I guess I just want to get across based on your conversation with me today is, yeah, there's a learning curve, but you can have fun along the way. And these things aren't out of your reach, right? I mean, like the, the software that's available now, yeah, it's going to get better, but it's good enough to do some really cool stuff, like way more than what, than what we're typically doing, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's so much you can do. Everyone knows how to use Zoom, but how, how it's the content, right? It's going back to it's, I don't, I really don't think it's the tools. It's how you use them. I think the tools are pretty much here. Zoom just announced Zoom events, which is designed for events planners. It's not what I expected. It's basically the meetings, you know, the Zoom meetings or the Zoom webinar with a, with a wrapper, but it shows the direction they're headed. It shows that, right. you know, they're going to listen to their customers. I think that, yeah, the software is going to get a lot better, but we need to keep our jobs, right? We need to make these events happen. And uh, there, there's no lack of tools. It's how we use them. Absolutely. Okay. So you've prepared um, some, some great tips. So let's go through uh, your, your top five tips for getting the most out of uh, hybrid events. You can start so with anyone you want. Well, I'll start with, you know, get out of your comfort zone, right? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. we, if you it might not be comfortable for you, but, um, for me, that means standing up, moving around, breaking the cables, right. Being able to move. And, uh, for other people that might be, um, walking through a city, but remember you don't have to do everything yourself. So what, I, what we've done at the present summit and the stream geek summit, I hire somebody to take a live streaming phone and take us somewhere that we want them to take us. They take us to Times Square. They take us to beautiful churches for a worship summit that we do. Get creative with who you hire and make sure they have a good cellular connection. Make sure they know how to send you a live stream. You can stay in your central area, right? So, so get out of the comfort zone and, and think about, look at, I, I just look on YouTube. Who's, who can bring value to my event? I can hire them. 
they've got they they've got an affinity. You know, if their audience works with your audience, that's a big. And I think influencers are huge um, in this space. I think they're undervalued still to this day. So mm-hmm. you don't have to do everything yourself, but but you know, if you think it's speaker A, B, and C, it might only be speaker C. It's actually a musical performance that you need to get people excited. And it's actually like a virtual tour with somebody who's amazing that is, you know, you got to mix things around and uh, get out of that comfort zone. The next tip I have is plan out the climax. Mm-hmm. Every event should have a climax, you know, whether it's the, the Super Bowl halftime show, you know, wh- whatever it is, plan it out. And that's like the ultimate value where you're, you're hoping all the bells and whistles are going to go. This is where, you know, the keynote just happened and now poof, you know, where are we going to go from there? But remember that even the, the climax is so important. It's such a special moment. You want to be able to extend the value. And this is something for like a keynote speaker, but it's also for an event planner. M- make a great exit. So when you're done, make the exit good and extend the value, you can extend the value of an event by creating a networking group, create a Facebook group, create a LinkedIn group for the event, invite everyone there so you can extend the networking that you're already, you know, a lot of events are selling the value of networking. Well, how do we extend that all year and then reinforce it when the event comes next year? So extend the value. There's a lot of tools for, whether you, you could start a Slack channel just for the yep. event, right? I mean, there's so many ways to extend the value. And I feel like a lot of event planners are like, all right, the event's over. It was great. It's done. And I, I, I challenge you to try to find ways to extend the value. Mm-hmm. I've been kind of blurring all these together. Hiring entertainment is one that most event planners know how to do. Um, but now we're not talking about setting up an entertainer on a stage. We might be bringing them in remotely. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost a lot less. And we're going to be able to bring them in to the virtual experience quite easily. If there's an in-person audience, maybe we're putting them up on a projector. Not saying you have to, but if 90% of your audience is virtual now, why not, you know, skip paying for the flights for the band, bring them in that way. We've done that many times. The cost of having G Love and Special Sauce, who used to be a really big (laughs) band in the 90s and the 2000s at the present summit. I think he was willing to do like 3,500. You know, he didn't have to leave his basement. Uh, you might might be getting a letter from him after the show, but uh, he's like, my prices went up since then, Paul. Come on, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, but and and I negotiated. You know, I was like, dude, come absolutely. on, you're, you're a cool guy. He's from Philadelphia. I was like, you know, you're not leaving your house. Just 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 give us a break. We, we want your, your name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your point Sorry, stands though. Your point stands though. They're going to be cheaper to get virtually than they are in person. That's for darn sure. Uh, so so folks, I just wanted to. Just check in with those who are watching. We are in in the final segment of our discussion with with Paul and getting the most out of virtual hybrid events. So if you do have any further questions while he's live, uh, be sure to post them in the chat now. Uh, so Paul, let's continue with your tips on getting the most out of hybrid events. All right. So I went through. That was four already. My last one is you should be charging for access. Mm-hmm. Now. I think there should always be a free element. I really do. I think that any event, any size, unless it's truly private, should have a free a free element. And I talk about this in my book. Whether it's just free that you're live streaming the first speech or just live streaming up until the, it starts, there should be something that's free on social media, building up the demand, getting people excited, getting their attention, getting their focus, and then the, the, the payment gateway may or may not happen. Now, when you're charging for access, you're asking attendees to give it a value, right? Or do you value this, even if it's a dollar? There's so many ways to say, all right, well, the value of this ticket is $1,000, but you can have it for $89, you know, or 15, you know what I mean? But give it a high value. Give it the highest value that you think is reasonable Maybe you'll offer early bird discounts. Maybe you'll do things. But I think that thinking of the VIP access really challenge yourself to be like, how much value are we, can we possibly deliver in a virtual environment and charge and then have a free side. But people do want to pay to attend good events and they do want to offer value. In fact, transformational experiences are much more valuable than commodities. They're more valuable than simple services. That's what we want as, you know, as individuals. That's the modern economy. That's like the synopsis of, 
uh, Joseph Pine's book, The Experience Economy, is we want to pay for experiences. We want mm. to pay for it. Don't go fully free. Spend some time figuring out what the value is and then how you're going to deliver on it. Absolutely. And you know, one of the things I really like about it too is, <clears throat> so I had, a, I had a friend send me a link the other day of, of an event that was just like, it, I'm not going to throw the vendor under the bus, but it was like a marketing schlock event. And I said to him, I said, I'd like to see them charge pay-per-view for this and see who would actually show up. Uh, and the answer is very few people would. <clears throat> and so the thing I like about your model is that when you have to charge for something, it challenges you to deliver something special and valuable. I have a quote that I picked up from one of your events I attended where someone said, our attendees don't feel like paying for recorded videos. Um, which, which I thought really summed it up very well. Like, you know, so, so a typical so-called virtual or, or, or hybrid event where you're watching a bunch of recorded videos, well, you're not gonna be able to charge for that. So, uh, so, so give that some thought. Uh, on the other hand, I have a friend who charged, uh, upwards of a thousand dollars for access, virtual access to one of her conferences in specialized supply chain areas. So that, that shows you the amount of value she was able to deliver on that. Uh, I don't think most of us are, are, are prepared to charge a thousand dollars for a virtual event yet, but it gives you some idea of what is, what is possible. We have a, a question here, uh, or a comment to me. The most important part, uh, is two way engagement during the event. While there are some tools that allow and encourage it, but we great, to hear more ways to get the missed networking opportunities. That's from a writ. Paul, you want to comment on that? Well, certainly, you know, LinkedIn groups, Facebook groups. Um, another one that we use, which was quite interesting, um, is obviously, you know, there's YouTube and Facebook comments and things of that nature that you should, you should have a person um, definitely, you know, watching those comments, bring them to the audience and make the people feel like they're heard showing comments up on the screen. But an interesting one that we did was we actually used the Zoom chat interface. And I don't know if a lot, a lot of people don't know Zoom has like an integrated chat. So the plan was, you know, YouTube and Facebook, there's, there's live stream, there's, there's um, chats there. We can answer those. But in the Zoom chat, that is in the Zoom meeting client, and you can create a whole group of people and invite all your attendees to it. We had a, everyone who paid for a ticket got into there, and it's almost like a Slack that's integrated into Zoom. So you've got your right. Zoom meeting, you've got your integrated fully video audio communication, but then when that Zoom meeting's gone, you've still got a persistent chat that you have for the event. And that's what Zoom events has kind of done because they've seen how people are using that functionality and now that's built into zoom events slack would be another alternative but allowing it that networking to continue beyond the event uh, via chat message all those group sharing collaboration tools that are available yeah i went to an interesting event it was a science fiction event so it wasn't an enterprise software event but they were using discord for some of those channels and i thought it worked pretty well um, and it was the same kind of thing where they have an ongoing discord throughout the year and then they had some event specific channels. And so I, I think to your point, there's a lot of untapped potential, uh, just with existing software and tools to, to do that. I also think event software is going to get better. So for example, I went to some events that had some speed dating options and I actually thought it was pretty fun and pretty good where you would just kind of like have, okay, here's five minutes with some random person and and good discussions would happen sometimes and you exchange contact information and you know a, after a long time of not meeting people face to face it's not a bad thing but i think they those things are going to get better right where they're going to get better at like pairing you with people who share your interests so it's not totally random but it's like you know it's a connection of people who want to work on the same topic um but there there's a lot out there now you can do with this paul did we we got to all your tips right Yes. All right. But we do have a couple of gotchas as well. Common mistakes. Let's do those. Uh, what are a couple of common mistakes you see that, that don't work well? Well, one thing is everyone's made an audio mistake in the past. So obviously, if you're going wireless, check your batteries. If you're setting up a live streaming system, do it the day before and test everything. Don't do it the morning of, right? Give yourself time. So time, 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 prep, obviously. Prep on the marketing side, right? Because you don't want to do all this work and not get anybody there. You need a lot of time to, to lay all of this stuff out and do the marketing. You guys know that. But prep on the setup side of the actual tech 
and the audio because if your audio doesn't work, you're you're pretty much you know you're lost. Um, what was the other one I had? Um, you know, sometimes there's literally events with no entertainment. So I, I feel like you got to find, even if it's just going to be preparing jokes, you got to figure out some way to be entertaining and, and find that edutainment um, capability. Uh, and I'm, I'm lost for what the other one was. Cause I have my notes here, but I forgot my third one. I'm sorry, John. Oh, no worries. Those were good. Uh, yeah, and, and we have a comment here about recorded videos for that. Go to webcast. Look, I, I think I think it's the kind of thing where where even webcasts, to be honest with you, need a huge upgrade because the thing to remember is while webcasts are free, uh, I, I I always make a distinction, but I call it free premium. Free premium is what I call things that, that are gated that require some kind of a sign up. And I think we're we're actually losing our tolerance for free premium content as well. Uh if I sign up for something like that, it better be good because I know I'm going to get spammed for my trouble of going and it takes time to complete the form. So I think a lot of these things apply and, you know, whether or not you have, you take Paul up on all of his monetization advice, remember too, that data is a form of compensation also. And so I think when you put on superior content online, you're also going to get more data with, with the caveat where I totally agree with Paul that there should always be some kind of free something going on as well for, for people. So it's that balance between free and, and gated that I think we all have to strike. Uh, someone says, turn off out, outlook. If you're using your laptop, no one needs the dings. I mean, uh. it, it is, it is true too, that like, that I think a lot of those, a lot of those issues that we run into um, are things that we just, we don't take enough time to, to get our laptop set up properly. Hey, Christine, it's so nice to, to see you on my chat. Christine and I went to high school together, so which was not yesterday. I, I wish it was. Uh, Christine, I hope you're doing great out there. Miss you. Uh, she says, something that happens too often is too little time is left for actual Q&A of valuable presenters. Everyone wants structured content. Rarely enough time for QA of stuff that bubbles up during the plan. Prezzo. I think this happens because people events want to deliver enough value. A lot of the value is in the unscripted combos. You've been reading my stuff, haven't you, Christine? I mean, that is that is it, Paul, right? I mean, I think we underestimate so much the value of of these unstructured interactions and 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 we spend way too much time in broadcast mode, which is not really what people are, are craving these days, I don't think. Well, I agree. And, you know, I mean, there's a couple, there's one thing in reflection that I look back on hosting live streams for many, many years and having content is I look back at all the people that I interviewed and all the people that we had on the shows and all the speakers and all the entertainers and all the people I met in the conferences. And that's the real value is the network that you're building. Um, yeah. So if you are, um, you know, an event host or something, I mean, those people that you're talking to, those are your the people who are going to send you referrals. That you're getting face, like we're getting FaceTime right now, John. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, I would if we were had a breakout Zoom session, we would be getting FaceTime with 20 or 30 people, right? And that's that FaceTime that you get and helps you build your network and eventually get that referral that is probably worth more than you know the tickets that you're charging for a person possibly at a virtual event. Yeah, and, and Thomas here says not being in broadcast mode all the time is what he likes about this particular show. And, and granted, like my show is intentionally kind of anarchic, but that's just because I'm so sick of watching passive content and I don't understand why why we can't let people interrupt us and, and make us smarter with their questions. And it, it's just, it's it's right there now. I think you, you made an important point earlier. It does require a little more skills to build up to that like it takes some practice to figure out how to get the right staffing to monitor a chat and surface questions and make sure the virtual audience is included but it can be done these are not this you know this it's not like trap going to the moon in a rocket or something i mean we can learn these skills i agree completely that's what i'm really passionate about that's why we started the stream geeks um it's not easy for everybody and we totally understand that um, but thank you so much for having me on, Don. It's been so much fun. Yeah, and you got a you got a little shout out here. We'd love to see more presenters like Paul engaging energy. Absolutely. Um, oh, and and then then we got a nice nice thing. Good moderation. Yeah. Well, well, look, I I I admit that the good moderation is 
is is a skill and i've practiced a lot but it's like i said there's other people that can learn it you just have to embrace it and it is a little bit different than in person moderation i would say so you do have to get some experience online doing the moderation in order to get get good at it um but paul i'm so glad to have you and thanks for letting me try your stuff your huddle cam hd stuff even though i I probably uh, don't sell it too well because I'm still like in a learning curve myself on the production side, but you come on. I was like a little intimidated because I'm like, Paul's going to look so awesome next <laughs> to me, but I, I took the plunge. Um, but, uh, but yeah, absolutely. You, you were great. Um, so thanks so much for, for coming. My pleasure. Thank you everybody who was tuning in. I yeah. uh, really appreciate the questions and uh, it was a pleasure. Okay, Paul, I'm going to field this last question, but you can sign out and head out. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. So uh, I love that. We still have Paul's set. That's perfect. Um, yeah, Christine, small Zoom breakouts can be an intimate experience. Absolutely. And there's different ways of doing it too. You can um, you can do uh, – Paul, I'm going to take you off offline here. Paul's been booted from the studio, but not, not for disciplinary reasons. Cause he had to go, um, small zoom breakouts can be an intimate experience. Absolutely. And the breakout room technology is a great example of something that's totally underutilized and you can use it in a couple ways. You can use it to randomize encounters, which can be very cool. Uh, you can also use it to structure people around topics that they want to do in a breakout room. That's great for projects or even activist settings. Uh, the one thing I would say is sometimes you do need to pay attention to facilitating the small group breakouts. I've talked to some people who found themselves in awkward situations in breakout rooms because there wasn't really any facilitator and they were like, oh, what do we do? What do we talk about? Uh, so, and, and there's always issues with airtime and alpha personalities dominating conversations. But the, the this is what so frustrates me is these are not issues that are impossible to tackle that they can be tackled and you can do it. And it's well worth it because your alternative is the stale broadcast content that no one really wants to see anymore. So they, they, you can just go on YouTube and watch that anytime. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. Great to see you again. LinkedIn user. I know who exactly who you are. I'm pretty sure anyway. Um, and yeah, you might've missed at the beginning, but I was, I had to can the video show for a while cause I just wasn't feeling well. I could, I could still write, for Diginomica and stuff. So I, all my writing was there, but you have to feel a certain way in order to be willing to come on video every week. I'm going to try to do this every week on Fridays for now. Um, but the time, the frequency may vary a little bit until I get my steam up. So I'm not committing to every week just yet. Thank you, Christine. It was, uh, was awesome to see you on the chat and I look forward to catching you on one of our high school zoom gatherings. Uh, okay. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Great to see you too, man. It's always always better when you're in my chat. So thanks for making it happen. And thanks everyone for joining me. And thanks again to, to Paul for, for teaching me so much and sharing that with listeners. Talk to you guys later.